you could just see pictures and see how powerful the story is, right? So Sala, Sada has celebrated his first birthday. He's headed um, back home sometime before Christmas. And um, Flora decided last week would be a good time to have appendicitis. Um, if you know Flora, it just fits. <laughs> so we're under strict instructions not to give her the microphone because she's on pain meds. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. Um, so um, Tim, I'm going to kind of hand you the mic and tell the story like you have at the time, three teenagers and an elementary child, and now a college kid, and two teenagers, and, and you decided this was a good time to bring a baby into your life. So, um, wow, powerful. Share your story. Well, um, I'd say a couple of years ago, I'm now actually about three years ago, uh, the seed was planted. Uh, my wife, as a nurse, uh, overlapped with another nurse who was specializing in cleft palate repair and was there working with one of the children in, in Flora's unit and so they got to talking and it kind of planted that seed and then as the years went by uh, it popped up again on the radar I think through social media and uh, as that did it sort of captured Flora and she said what do you think and I was like well uh, it seems like we're in a good spot to, to try this you know we were had a lot of questions a lot of things that we need to figure out and figured it'd be this long runway of decision of maybe half a year or something but within like two months he's in our home. So we were, it was a little bit uh, like everything just fell into place uh, with the organization called Ray of Hope that we've worked through. They bring children mostly with cleft palate but other medical conditions over and partner with local hospitals to provide the medical care they need for, for free. And so um, they need a place to stay though. This is their 55th child, I think they're up to 57 now. And so they have, uh, we became a host family. So yeah, not adopted and not illegally either. <laughs> He said adopted, <laughs> not illegally. <laughs> uh, so, but yes, he returns home to his family. His parents are anxiously waiting him. He was born a twin. In his culture, that is considered a curse, as well as the cleft palate. Uh, the cleft palate is a curse uh, that they will generally um, end the child's life. And so having him go back uh, medically repaired, in their eyes, is he's cured, he's healed. They see it as a miracle. And when his dad first dropped off the child, uh, Sada, you saw the pictures of how thin and, and um, just dehydrated, failing to thrive, and uh, handed him over. And then a few weeks later, we got to send the first pictures of him at our home, uh, just wrapped up in a warm place. And apparently his father had driven, ridden by motorcycle and bus, 240 miles to, to see the liaison, to see those first pictures. And when he did, he fell to the ground weeping because he, he really thought he'd never see his son alive again when he handed him over. And so the trust of their family to us is pretty humbling. powerful that a mom and a dad in Africa said yes we're willing to trust and then we have a mom and dad here in the United States who said yes we're willing to trust um, these parents said yes to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in a really powerful way um, so curious what has this meant to your family how has your family grown changed um, what impact has it had on your lives well I think we learned pretty early that uh, Diapers and all night is is a young person's sport, and so we <laughs> <laughs> takes a little bit longer to get up after that. Uh, but we've we've managed. We'll still cross that finish line somehow. But um, I mean, it's just been you know. I mean, anybody who's done any kind of missions work and goes and comes back always says that that they went to help, but really they feel like they're the ones that were the most blessed by the experience. And I think we can say that we we love seeing what has happened for him and that we get to maybe be a launching pad to a better life for him when he goes home. But the impact upon our family has been immeasurable. Um, the people we've met, the um, ways that others have sort of jumped in to, to help provide things for him, and um, just the joy he's brought. Our, our children have, um, they just have blown us away in terms of not only their, um, not only their you know, involvement and love for him, but their support and their, we used to call our, our kids, we'd call them our interns because they were really uh, jumping right in, getting their hands dirty, helping out. But um, I think that when we were first starting off, you know, a lot of the questions I had kind of came out of a protective standpoint of what about our kids? What about the impact on them? When he goes home, how's that gonna affect us? And that's still a sort of an unknown for us because it's about less than a month or about a month away from now. Um, but we figured the risks of not opening ourselves up to this seemed greater than the risks that come with the heartbreak of him going home. 
And we want our children to be able to experience that. We want ourselves to be able to experience that and to know that we're open to those things, even if they come with some, some pain at the end. So we've learned a lot in that regard. We talk a lot um, at Sunrise about saying yes to God. Wow, right? This is a huge yes on your guys' part as well as um, Sada's parents and his family. Um, I, I know that you guys hate the spotlight on you. Um, and I think you'd be the first, I know you are the first to say it takes a village because if you follow um, Parsley's on Facebook or social media, there's always respite care and a team of doctors and a team of nurses and a team of Ray of Hope and all of that. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think if I were to just add anything, it'd be um, a, a, a thank you from both of us, especially those of you here who have chipped in in one form or another. We've got respite cares in the room who basically where he would need to go if both of us had to work or something uh, took, took us out of town and he needed to go somewhere. Um, but even just down to, you know, diapers and, and bringing over, helping with the food or just any number of things has been so helpful. Um, and I think uh, going forward, our, our request would simply be uh, prayer, uh, prayer for, for this little guy. He goes home to a culture very different than what he spent his first year getting to know. Um, very different faces, very different languages, everything. And he's from a country that's in a lot of turmoil at the moment, a significant amount of turmoil. And so um, it's hard to, to let him go from what we, what we perceive to be the safety of something. But it's just because he's right here with us. And we know that God will know where he is. He keeps track of all of us. And so um, we have to figure out a way to trust that and keep trusting that. But um, we would ask for your prayers for him as he goes out into the world that he would bring his little missionary message to the world of, of what, um, what God's love can do for a person. So we would ask for that. Yeah, amen. Um, Aiden and where's Evie? Is she here? Yeah, all the kids. Come on up. Ben, up. Emma's not here, is she? Okay, Emma's at college. But you'll see the video. Fred, would you go on and come up and join us? And, um, Lord, we thank you for this child that you've loved so dearly, that you paid a price for with your very life. And we now pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon him. We pray for the moment that he will say yes to you as Lord and Savior. We pray for the people right now that will bring that message to him because as much as he's been loved here, he won't remember anything from sunrise. He won't remember the message. He'll just know that he has been loved. God, may someone, may someone send that message to him. God, we, we entrust him to you as a mighty warrior in the kingdom of God. I claim him as one of the 300 I've been praying for that will go around the world and will share your message. God, I pray uh, for the day in which we're re reunited in heaven. We can um, recall what you've done and hear the story in its, um, in its entirety. God, I pray that you protect this family. I pray that you guard their hearts. And I pray that you would change them um, completely uh, because of this. I pray, God, that many will come into your, your kingdom because of this message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for what you've um, taught Sunrise, for what you've, yeah, definitely. Let's, let's raise a hallelujah right now. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We thank you so much for what you're doing. God, show off your power and glory in this place right now. Somebody needs you to win a battle for them right now. God, I pray that you would do it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Uh, 75 years ago, in fact, uh, uh, Alex was singing that song. I was singing it in the middle of the night. And I came in here, and I was going to tell Alex, can we play that some week? And he was playing it right then. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, because somebody needs to hear this. It might look like you're surrounded right now. And your response in the middle of being surrounded is, is so critical that you don't give up, but you praise him in the middle of the storm. Uh, 75 years ago, um, in the Battle of the Bulge, it was around Christmas time this year, 75 years ago, the little town of Bastogne was completely surrounded by the German army. 
um, and they had no reinforcements coming for a little while, and the German commander sent a message to the American commander saying that we've surrounded you and we give you 24 hours uh, to, um, you know, to surrender, otherwise we're going to annihilate you. And the American commander, Anthony McAuliffe, does anybody remember his response, a one-word response uh, from the American commander to the German commander? Nuts. Nuts. And some of you are felt surrounded right now. You feel like you're right in the battle, and that's the response. I'm not giving up. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Uh, this week I heard a pastor, he's try, I guess he was trying to encourage his pastors. It really didn't encourage me at all uh, because he said this. Um, he said 90% of what your people will hear from you this week uh, will be forgotten by 90% of the people within 90 minutes of when, you hear, when they hear it. Isn't that encouraging to the pastor? 90% <laughs> of you will forget 90% of what I say in 90 minutes. You know what I believe? Somebody, one person's going to hear one thing that they'll never forget. One person's going to hear something that will stick with them for the rest of their life. And I believe that. And will you be that one person? Um, does God have something for you? Wasn't the Parsley story incredible? I, I, can't, I can't compete with that in any way. That is the message for the morning. But I want you to know that... Um, uh, you know, I, I get a little bit of what you guys are going through because uh, our neighbor last week went on vacation and she asked Isaac to take care of her fish. <laughs> and he agreed because she said she'd give him a dollar a day. Um, so, uh, you know, like we've been taking care of a fish for a week. <laughs> they kind of raised the bar, didn't they? <laughs> didn't they raise the bar? Like amazing. Like that's what you're capable of. That's why you were put on earth. It's not for something simple like caring for a little fish and calling that your good deed. But God has something absolutely incredible. And so here's the one thing I want to say. Um, it's probably the hardest thing that you ever have gone through or ever will go through that God will use the most because he loves to beat Satan with his own stick. Whatever the hardest thing that you have ever gone through in your life, if you will offer that to God and you'll say, God, get glory out of this, God will. He doesn't want to see anything wasted. He loves to, to, loves to tell a story. So he wants to use the hard things in our life, not the easy things. You weren't made for an easy life. You were made for greatness. And you were made to see God's glory come through the hard moments in your life. Uh, somebody needs to hear that today. Remember last week's message? Uh, uh, no, absolutely you don't. Um, <clears throat> can I remind you of last week's message? Uh, you know, there's this guy that had a bunch of ground that produced a great crop. And he had this huge problem. Like, there was so much harvest that he didn't know where to put it all. And so he said to himself, I'm going to tear down my barns. Wouldn't that be a waste? Why didn't he just build another barn? But, you know, he had so much stuff that wasting it wasn't the issue. Storing it was this problem. Like, where do I store it all? And he began to say to himself, like, okay, now I've got enough. Now I can eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, I've got enough to be comfortable right now. And do you remember God's words back to him? You fool. You fool. You, you think life was meant to get to the moment where you can eat, drink, and be merry. But life wasn't meant for the easy parts of your life. Life was meant for the hard parts. And God's going to use the hard parts of your life for his glory. And so I would just want you to like, look at it. Just begin to make a list of these are the days that I would hate to go through again. Some of them were from your own cause. Some of them were the cause from someone else. Some of them just happened. But I want you to know, God doesn't waste a hurt. He doesn't waste a hard thing, and he's going to use it for his glory. But if you buy the lie that life was meant to eat, drink, and be merry, 
this is what I'm predicting. Uh, not only predicting, you are experiencing it right now. When you have enough that you can get by without God, you get absolutely miserable. But if I were to, if I were to ask every one of you to tell me what the closest time in your life that you were to God, you were to God, wouldn't you go back and recall some hard moment? You weren't made for the easy life. You were destined for greatness. You were destined for some hard things. Uh, today as we deal with our scripture, today's scripture is the opposite. Not, not God doesn't call somebody a fool. God calls somebody wise. He calls somebody shrewd. Wouldn't you like God to come to you and say, you get it. You're wise. You're doing it the right way. This is known as the hardest parable of all to, uh, to really uh, interpret. But as we look at it here today, uh, the parable of the uh, shrewd manager, he says, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. When you understand this passage, Jesus um, is putting God in the place of the rich man. God owns it all. Everything that we have belongs to God. God is the rich man in this passage. Who's, the, uh, uh, who, who's us in this passage? We're the person that's accused of wasting his possession. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. This guy is getting fired. He's losing his job. He begins to think to himself, you know what? Um, like his head begins to spin. Like, wh what do I do now? What do I do now? I've got just a little bit of time. The master's taking away my job. I could go out and dig. No, I'm not strong enough to dig. I could go out and beg. No, I, I couldn't do that. Then it dawns on it. I, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. He's got a little scheme going. I, I get it. Now, I, now this is what I'm going to do. So we called in each of his master's debtors. These people that this man had loaned a lot of money to. He, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil. I just want to say, this is not part of the passage, but if you owe somebody 900 gallons of olive oil, you got a problem. Um, you got an <laughs> olive oil problem. Um, like, you're addicted. Um, I, I, I just put that in there. Uh, the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly. Why does he want him to do it quickly? Because this man just has a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity. He doesn't want to waste it. Sit down quickly. Make it 450. Now, anybody can do the math here. You owe 900. Now you owe 450. What's, what's happened? His debt's been cut in half. I want you to put this in perspective with your, your own life. When, when is the time in life that you were in debt the most? Get that number. And just imagine that somebody from the bank comes up and just says, you know what, I'm getting fired. Uh, you take your debt, what do you owe? And you cut it in half. What are you going to say to the banker right then? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. Isn't that what you'll do? And the person says, okay, I will. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He said, take your bill and make it 800. He's got a 20% off sale. And the same thing, he says, like, 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 imagine this happens to you. What would you do? Say, thank you, thank you, thank you. If there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. But what, what's he done? The master commended the dishonest manager. This is where everybody gets really confused. Jesus is telling the story, and he's, he's saying, this guy did a good job because he fleeced you out of your money, like he ripped you off, and you're praising him for it? He says he commended him because he acted shrewdly. Shrewdly is, is wisely. It's in his own best interest. For the people of this world are more wise or shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Like, they get it. They're, 
like, like if you thought about this for a second, you would know how to handle money. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Let's pause with that one. How much of our stuff do we get to keep? All of us know that. Like We know that there's going to be a day that what we have, it, it's gone. We'll pass it on to somebody else. They'll take care of it. They'll insure it and wash it and wax it and everything. And they'll pass it on to somebody else. And they'll pass it on to somebody else. We all know that our stuff uh, is just with us for a little bit of time. You know what he's saying in this? Use your worldly wealth, not for today, not for 2019, but use it for eternity. When you begin to say, how could I take what I have? How could I take my resources, my stuff, my time, my talent, my degree, and how could I turn that into something that would last for all of eternity? You know, how you look at the Parsley family tells a whole lot about how you look at God. How you look at the decision they made says a whole lot about what you believe about this passage. Because if it's just about right now, like how do I use this year uh, for the best, that is one of the most foolish decisions they could have ever made, isn't it? Like 2019, if they did it for 2019, uh, you might go up to Tim and go, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? Like, um, do you remember diapers? Oh, yeah, now I remember them again. Uh, you know, were you thinking about sleepless nights? Were you thinking how hard this is going to be on your family? Were you, were you thinking about how the, the kids will have to adjust and have, they'll have to take care of, of a little baby that belongs in Africa? And you begin to think about that. You begin to go, um, if you're thinking about 2019, it, it may not have been wise. But if you're thinking about eternity, I'm saying this is the best thing that's ever happened to their family. They would tell you this is the best thing. Like, like they would say, like when you get your teenagers to care for a little one, it changes your teenagers. It changes absolutely everything in your life. How you look at today and right now and how you look at your stuff right now, uh, it, it's, it's so critical in this passage. It says, what shall we do now? Verse 10, he tells us, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? So if you have, uh, verse 13, please. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and what? You know, wouldn't, he, wouldn't it be better if he said the devil on this? You cannot serve both God and the devil. But I'm telling you, no, nobody here is struggling with like, okay, is it God or the devil? Is it God or the devil? But how often do we get to the place where we say, you know, is it God or my stuff? Is it, is it God or 2019? Uh, is it God or, you know, I'm going to sleep tonight? Just raise the bar. Like, what has God given you? He's given you some time. He's given you some talent. He, he might have given you some resources. He's given you a heart. Uh, he's given you some abilities. And he's saying, you know, the wise ones are the ones that use whatever he's given you now in order to do something that will last for all of eternity. And in that case, man, this is, this is going to go on for all of eternity. It was a great decision. It was an incredible trade-off. There's a martyred missionary named Jim Elliott um, with several of his friends. They, they went down to the Alka Indians in South America. And uh, someone thought he was a fool. Like what, all, these, all these families with degrees and incredible talents. And to take several families, five families, 
and go to the Alka Indians and someone called him a fool to his face. And you know what he wrote down? He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Isn't that worth it? Like that is what this message is about. He's no fool who gives up what he cannot keep, some nights, some heartache, to gain something that he cannot lose. Some of you might be in a place where you say, you know what, I've, I've, I've done my part. Uh, it's now time for somebody else to do their part. If, if you believe that message, you've got one foot in the grave. You believe that message that take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. You know what he says, like, you fool, your, your, your life could be demanded of you this very night. That doesn't mean he going to die tonight. He means you've died the moment you've stopped using your life. Do you get that? I had a school teacher, retired school teacher, come up to me um, uh, this morning, just said, you know what, I've taken your messages and I've put them into practice. Um, instead of being retired, I went to the school and I asked, is there anybody that that you need help with? And they said, yeah, we've got a little kid. And this person goes and just works with a student in the school. You know what? That's the message right there. Like if you're done, you're done. But if you still got some time, you still got some energy, you still got some experience, if, you, if you've got something, why can't you use your something for the kingdom of God? I get it. We all get tired. When we, when we get tired... We make bad decisions, really bad decisions, in the middle of being tired. Um, this morning I saw a, a Facebook post by uh, a dear friend of mine. Uh, they've got a couple grown-up boys out serving God, doing some really good stuff. And she just put on this post how she misses her boys. And the, the, immediately I began to flash back to a Sunday school class probably about 15 years ago. Fifteen years ago, her kids, you know, uh, roughly at that moment, they're like a three-year-old and a five-year-old, or three-year-old and a six-year-old. Like, it's rough at that time. It, 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 she's tired. She's worn out. But I remember her saying to our Sunday school class, you know what? I, I think we're supposed to have another kid. And her husband, like, right there in the Sunday school class, no way. I'm not doing that. You know, I've done enough diapers. I've, you know, and he's like, and we're all like, yeah, man, that's a, that's a big decision to be doing that. And, you know, and then he says this last words. He says, and we can't afford it. We can't afford it. That is a lie. That is an absolute lie. There are so many people, like, you can afford to do whatever God has called you to do. Whatever God has called you to do. And if you feel like I can't afford to do something or I can't, like, it, it's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And I just know, I've known in talking to this family, we've stayed friends, dear friends, and they wouldn't have a problem with me sharing this. He said, I wish I'd have made a different choice. I wish I'd made a choice not based on a few years of changing diapers, but on what this child could do for all of eternity. This message needs to be translated into a thousand different ways for you and your life. What is it right now that you're tempted to say, you know what, I'm just done. I'm done with life. I've done my duty. You're not done. God has something more for you. Maybe you're surrounded right now. And in the middle of being surrounded, you're saying, you know what, I can't do it. This is so hard. I can't go on. You know what, you're just a miracle away from God doing something incredible. The hardest moment of your life is perhaps the thing that you were made for and meant for. If you, if you want to be in a place where you save your 2019, you're going to lose it. If you give up your 2019 for his sake and his kingdom, you'll never lose it. So I just want to pray for us right now. God, um, each person in this place is is saying the same thing. What do I do now? It's like the, the man there, like, what do I do now? Like, 
I'm too tired to dig or too, too worn out to dig and I'm too ashamed to beg. And God, give me your ideas. Like, what do I do now to take my little bit of time and little bit of opportunity and build your kingdom? God, in this place, there are people that are saying, you know what, I've done my job. It's time for me to eat, drink, and be merry. It's time for me to let somebody else do the job. God, it's also time just to get back in the game. God, I pray today that you would speak to each person and you'd, you'd help them practically know what they're to do. God, we do pray for the Parsley family. Thank you for them jumping in. And, and it's not about them, but they surrendered. And a mom in Africa surrendered. And in the surrender, you showed up and did a great miracle. We thank you.